This is a 1979 Travis Payne. Yeah. It's it's in the wood, and I've had this a long time. I actually got this way before Guns N' Roses. It's one of the oldest electric guitars I have. As far as how long I've had it, it's, it's it's actually I've got three of these, and it's the heaviest of the three. I use it for slide. It's just a killer sounding guitar. Yeah, it looks like it's finished. But I that's, it, that's the worst. Recycle. How many things did you, did you ever, did you always search the oh, one yeah, ads the recycler, looking for stuff? The recycler was that was the go to. That's Craigslist. Trade. Of the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does the aluminum do? Do you hear something specific well, I, in the tone? I think one of the reasons why I play slide on it is I think the resonance from the metal on the slide and the metal on the neck actually has a make it effect. Shit. This was one of the. This was the first good acoustic Ooh, guitar Epiphone. I ever had. And it was, it was, you know, we talk about what's your first guitars, and this was the first brand name acoustic I ever got back when I was like probably 16. And it was given to me by a couple who I babysat their kid, and they gave it to me, and it was like a godsend. So I figured I'd mention it because it has such sentimental value of anything. Of all that early stuff that you had, is this the only one that you still this is have? The, this is the only thing that I think, yeah, this is the only thing I have from that long ago, from like the teenage years. Yeah, yeah. The thing that really inspired me to play guitar guitar was Steven Adler had an electric guitar at his house when I first met him when we were about 13, 14 years old. He used to plug this thing in and uh, just bang on it to kiss records on full blast. That in itself was very exciting. And so I opted to play bass. Since he was playing guitar, I was going to play bass. And I went around local music school. I didn't have an instrument. Went in there and talked to the teacher and I said, you know, I want to learn how to play bass. And he just sat me down and tried to ask me a few questions, trying to sort of figure out what it was that I was really getting at, what I, what I wanted to achieve. And while he was talking to me, he was playing some Eric Clapton licks, I think cream licks on electric guitar. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Because I really didn't know that much about guitar at the time. Let me ask you a question about November Rain video. You have all these guitars. Maybe you're like, I, I want to use that guitar in a video and have it more, or was it just? It was just, you know, I had the guitar. I never used it in the studio for anything. And we were doing that video and I thought, well, you know, it's a cool looking guitar. I'll use it for that. And that's, that's, you know, it didn't require a lot of thought. How hard was that video to shoot? Like that video, like you could do that, that shit was, with a drone now and it would yeah, cost yeah, like right? 300 I, bucks. I, you know, <laughs> I thought that was my last day on earth. Really? Because those, that helicopter was diving at me and I thought you know this will be it. I got it in 88. I was on the road with, with uh, guns and I was retiring my two replica 59 replicas yeah, yeah. that I had. I called Gibson and they sent me these two guitars. Not it wasn't this original case it was those black hard yeah, protectors. You know when you buy used guitars and you see the next one yeah. after you think about the amount of time and work that went into doing that. This is actually for me. So I was inspired by when I first started. Jimmy Page, Joe Perry, Brad Woodford, Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, Keith Richardson, Nick Taylor, Philly Gibbons, Joe Walsh. Those are like the, off the top of my head, the main guys I was listening to. When I used to buy records, from different bands that I was interested in. And I didn't go and buy their studio records, I bought their live albums. So I was definitely into the sort of like, you know, crazy live performance kind of thing. You know, that sort of attack. It wasn't about, you know, sort of recording studio achievements, sonic nuances in the studio. Apocalyptic Love was designed to be live in the studio and capture no overdubs, no edits, no anything, just pure live recording. Whereas this one, we recorded live in the studio, but there's overdubs, there's harmonies. I just wanted to make a more produced record that had, I, there was a lot of songs in Apocalyptic Love which I would have loved to have done some layering on and some harmonies and stuff, but we strove to do it live. So on this record I sought after getting a really good recording, really good, good textured recording. Sweet Child of Mine came up when Guns N' Roses was sitting in a house. The house was basically totaled. I don't know how long we've been living there, but it was basically a shell. And one afternoon, Izzy and I basically were the only ones that lived there at this point. Duff had come over to visit and Axel had come by and Izzy and Duff and I were sitting downstairs and I was just playing my guitar and Izzy had his guitar and it was in the middle of the afternoon and where the riff came from I don't really remember but I started playing this pattern and I mean it was one of those things that I was in the process of discovering as I came up with each note and sort of turned it into something that kept rotating you know and then it was, along the way Izzy started playing the chords that went along with it behind it I guess Axel had overheard us playing it. He was upstairs and uh, unbeknownst to and started writing lyrics. Back in 1986, when I did the Appetite for Destruction record, my manager gave me a copy of a Les Paul 59. At that time, I don't know if they were doing 59 reissues, but it was this really beautiful um, handmade 59 copy, basically. 
And so I used that for that album and consequently, you know, many albums since then. And so at one point I was going to Gibson. I said, well, why don't we make a real Gibson copy of a Gibson copy? So basically the Slash Les Paul is modeled after the 59 copy of the Les Paul that I've had since then. The wobble pedal is the one pedal that sort of consistently works in tandem with your emotional sort of ebb and flow. Right, yeah, it's very vocal, obviously. Yeah. But I like the way you sometimes will just leave it slightly cocked yeah. for a certain thing. So, yeah, it's just, it's it's great for sustain if you can find that right spot. But you sometimes use it very subtly. It's not just a shaft thing. You're mm -hmm. doing some pretty, right. pretty and Although I stuff. do enjoy the, the shaft. But yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the only effect that I really like to use because it's manual. And I mean, I, I like the voice box too, but that is such a specific sound. Yeah, you can't use it all. As many tobacco burst guitars and stuff that you've played and different sunburst stuff, I still kind of associate you as a gold top. Yeah, I love gold tops. Guy, what, is, what was your fascination? Or what, it, it was a sound thing. I, I mean, aesthetically, I can't say that, you know, back in the day, I looked at a gold top and said, that's, you know. Yeah. It was really because I played one and it just, they have a certain sound. And it's funny because it's really just a Les Paul, different finish. But Les Paul standard, basically. You use pretty heavy strings, 11 through 48. So yeah. a lot of people use heavy bottom, but not heavy top. Yeah. When you are 11, 14, 18, and you bend a lot, do you have to keep your hand strength up to do that? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I play a lot. Yeah. That's that's the main thing. I find that when as soon as we have a break and I'm off for a period of time, I can play at home all the time, even with those strings. But when the way that you play live is so different than you play anywhere else. Right. I sort of work back up to that place where I can, you know, play for three hours. Do you remember the first time you got your hands on an original 59 Les Paul? Yeah, I think the, the first time I ever got my hands on one to play one was the one I bought. Well, besides some shows, it was actually really the first 59 I ever got to, to got my hands on, and I, I bought that one. <laughs> but other than that one, uh, the first one that I played outside of that was a 59 that I bought from Albert Molinaro. Well, you know, yeah. the guitars are us and all that. And, uh, um, and I still have that guitar. You know what, I've, I've just gotten into the habit of wearing sunglasses pretty much all the time. It is, and it really, it comes from, originally it just came from bright lights, you know? And mm -hmm. it just became, you just get so used to having them on. It's mm -hmm. not really a cool thing anymore, it's not about <laughs> that, it's just, you know, somebody's always got a fucking camera nowadays in your face, or whatever it is, with mm -hmm. the flash, and yeah. I just, I think it's an, another way of just hiding in general. But do you get them free at least? I, I, I don't have a deal with Ray-Ban, but they're nice enough to give me sunglasses. If you had to just do a gig with one guitar... Yeah, if, if I was on a desert island, that would probably still, probably, be, yeah. still be the one. There's a lot of hits on this guitar, Yeah, man. And, and we use it for this this latest record, right? Yeah. And and I would I would put it, you know, I would use it, and Dave would go, what's that? What's that guitar? <laughs> well, that's the Derek, you know, okay. So he totally recognized it when we were doing the session, because there's some songs I didn't do with this guitar. And he would, you know, go like, okay, so that's cool, this particular guitar is cool. But as soon as I put this back on, he goes, oh, I love that. <laughs> Did he try and buy it from you? Did he no, offer? He no, didn't even try. No, but he did. He did influence me purchasing a couple of guitars that I didn't necessarily need. Talking to the studio, how different is your setup in the studio? Is it the same kind of deal? It's pretty much the same. You know, half stack and a Les Paul. And gotcha. a <laughs> yeah, for the most part. And the last album, Living the Dream, mm -hmm. which is great, by the way. Thanks. You recorded that kind of live, didn't you, with the band? Always. Yeah. You, I mean, the, the main thing is to capture that sort of feel of a band actually working. You know, the synergy of it working together. Right. Um, and then you can go back and do whatever overdubs you want to do, but the, the most important thing is to capture that sort of live integrity. Right, and you get that by people playing at the same time. Yeah. So this used to have the, the so piezo this was pickup a, a, there. A little switch, and there was a piezo pickup in the bridge, and it was sort of like a Pete Townsend kind of thing where you could just switch to acoustic, and it was actually pretty functional. You know? Instead of doing the double neck thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah that's guitar. exactly what it was. And I ended up pulling it out at some point because I wasn't doing the acoustic bit on it anymore. This was the main guitar for Velvet Revolver outside of Jessica. So it looks like Jessica it. sort of took a back seat. This became the the main guitar, and yeah, I beat the shit out of it. Look at that. There's like there's not that's not Murphy Lab. That's, no, that's Slash Lab right there. Oh my God, it's like into the body. I'm not sure what the belt buckle I was wearing was, but I would say <laughs> that's definitely a product of King Baby or Chrome Hearts. <laughs> yeah.